Johnson specified in her will that no monument or statue be erected in her name. Voila! Since 1922, this has been the only monument in the Greater Vancouver area to a Canadian writer. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the real Pauline Johnson, but it's an important symbol because Pauline Johnson started Canadian native literature beyond the oral traditions. Pauline Johnson, who was billed as the Mohawk Princess, was a pop star of her day. She entertained Queen Victoria and she gave Lost Lagoon in Vancouver its name. And when she died in 1913, thousands of people lined the streets for her funeral. This is Pauline Johnson's beloved Siwash Rock. She paddled here with Chief Joe Capilano from what is now the Capilano Indian Reserve across the water. And Chief Joe Capilano gave her the story of how this rock was formed by the Indian spirits. Pauline Johnson then republished this story in Legends of Vancouver, and that stands out as perhaps the first commercial book which packages Indian stories. Can you speak a little bit about Pauline Johnson, what she means to you? I think um, one of the things that, uh, that I, struck me very, very, when I was very young in grade school, when I first read some of her her poetry. I didn't realize she was uh, native. But I remember, um, and this I can recall, I had no, no one had said to me that she was native. But I remember going back to her poems and rereading them. And I remember the sound and the rhythm um, and the images, the images that were tied directly to the sound and rhythm and spoke. Um, this, uh, the images that spoke about the sounds and spoke about the rhythm rather than rather than using rhythm to enhance the words and I thought wow you know at that age I was thinking that's how that's how our people speak it sounds like how we use language and it was about uh, maybe in grade seven or eight and I realized that uh, Pauline Johnson was was a native person Jeanette Armstrong is one of the most influential native authors in North America. Best known for her novel, Slash, she speaks on Aboriginal issues at conferences around the world. She still lives on the Penticton Indian Reserve, where she was raised, and directs the Anelkin Center for Native Writers, an integral part of the movement to resurrect and empower Aboriginal culture. I'm uh, Barbara Helen Hill. Um, everybody calls me Helen. I'm from Six Nations. Um, of the Grand River in southern Ontario. My name is Russell Teed. I'm from Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Uh, my name is Darlene Hingley, and I'm from the Nak Asley Band, Fort St. James, which resides on Stuart Lake. My name is Brenda Prince, and I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, my name is Joni Erickson. I come from the Tlazdan Nation Territories in Fort St. James. My name is Geraldine Minosa, and uh, I come from Wabuska, Alberta. It's in northern Alberta. It's part of the Big big Stone Cree Nation. My name is William George. I'm from the Silhouette Broad Inlet Band in North Vancouver, BC. I'm Beth Cuthand, and I'm an instructor here at Anelkin. I'm from the Little Pine Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, and I'm a published poet. Education was uh, identified as a priority by our elders, our chiefs. Um, and our leaders, and uh, the mandate was created to develop uh, an Indian education center, an Okanagan Indian education center, and to be able to resource all the bands for educational purposes right from ground zero up to 100 years old, so education in its broadest sense. And so that's what this center is. It, it's it's uh, registered as the Okanagan Indian Educational Resource Society. And as a, as a resource society, a number of programs had to be developed in which that resourcing uh, happens and it takes place. So the writing school became one of the ways that we resource the, um, the um, breaking the silence, I guess, in terms of our stories, our voice, our positions, our thinking and our perspective. I like the way she repeated never again through it all, just to keep you uh... Uh, just to remind you 
never again, never again, all the way through. The never again is the is the anger, but it's it's a very controlled mm -hmm. anger mm -hmm. all the way through, and it flows very rhythmically in terms of the the pacing that you set. Uh, but that never again comes in at, at really essential moments. It's almost like a drum beat, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, you know, at, at the end of a round dance. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. what it reminds me of. Even though the two words like never and then again, because you're repeating mm -hmm. it like never again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sounds, the sounds. Good piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. And I really like the poem. I think by being involved in each other's uh, ancestral memory and cultures, uh, it serves to uh, strengthen people's own identification with their land and their spirits. William, do you want to read something <coughs> for us? <coughs> okay. Will this pass, pass, will this pass, this uncomfortable need for solitude, moments to be alone in Crow's Nest Pass, Alberta, listening for my rhythm. Tap, 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 can you hear it? Mountain rhythm was heard. The rain poured instantaneously and the blowing wind seemingly engulfed me. Move to it as it dances you, heart rhythm. Pass, will this pass? This inability to initially connect with other people. This voice says, you are a solitude, you always will be. No, I am a solitary being in a collective, feeling juxtaposed in a world asleep, trying to wake. I will connect with people, pen and paper connection. I write till my fingers bleed, I bandage it. I write till my heart bleeds, I pray this will pass. Wow. Good piece. All the imagery is just clear and hard hitting. Really, really, really one of your best pieces that I've heard. You know, I was thinking if you eliminated every word... For me, poetry line, is about recreating a moment, that that recreating an emotion, it, it and um, writing is, is more... is less about um, what I do and, and more about who I am. It seemingly engulfed me, but... I like this part too. When you when you uh, go from I write till my fingers bleed, I bandage it. I write till my heart bleeds. I actually started talking about the importance of the oral and literature, and the importance of some of the traditions and narrative traditions, and so on, and how we could <laughs> capture that, how we could think about that. And I thought these are these are literary concerns. Growing up in the hills, uh, one of your grandmothers adamantly refused to speak English. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. my, that was my grandmother, Christine, and uh, she refused to speak English to us. Uh, she she spoke some English, but it was very, um, uh, I guess, limited English. Um, we uh, when we visited her, she always. Uh, reprimanded us if we tried to use any English words and made sure that we just spoke Okanagan with her. And all her family was, was like that. And so it was a, for, for us it was a really good thing uh, in that the, uh, the, the communication in the home was always Okanagan. Much of your work is in the landscape of the grandmother, as you once put it. Mm -hmm. Who are the four women to which you dedicated your first book of poetry? Well, my book of poetry is dedicated to women who were rel relatives of mine, grandmothers. Uh, one of them is, is Christine Joseph, my, my paternal grandmother. And the other one is Morning Dove, uh, Christine Quintasket, who was one of my mother's great aunts. And uh, the other woman was my, my own aunt, um, Margaret Stilkaya, who was uh, one of my teachers and 
and confidant uh, from the time I was a young girl uh, until I was, you know, until she left us, and my my mother's mother, my maternal grandmother. This is a book by uh, Morning Dove, whose, uh, in our language, name was Hamismus. Uh, she published uh, this novel in uh, 1927. The, it's the first Native American novel that was published uh, in North America. And um, she, she was a great influence on, on my life. She influenced my thinking, as I was mentioning, um, with the books, uh, primarily the, the book of stories, and it was only later that I read th this novel of hers, but primarily the book of uh, the Okanagan stories. This just shows the photo of her. Yeah, this just came out reason recently. This is her uh, biography, and so there's a photograph of her at, at, at around the time that she died, and this is a photograph of her when she was younger. And it's just the same book. This is a collection of uh, stories that um, was published uh, in 1933. Uh, and this, this is the Coyote Stories collection. Uh, these are the Okanagan stories. These were the ones primarily that uh, really were influential in terms of reading in English and seeing in English the stories and published versions of them, the stories that I had heard since I was a child and realizing that it was important to do this. Is this the, the new version of This is the republished version of that, of, of this book. Um, it was um, re-edited and there's some introductory notes that are added to it and some photographs that are added to it. And it's a, it's a very nice collection. One of the other major writers in British Columbia who has preceded you is George Clutesy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments about how his work is important? Well, I met him, and uh, I uh, was influenced quite a bit uh, in in my development years. Um, he was doing a lot of um, public appearances, and um, I, in fact, he came here in Pen he came here to Penticton at one time, and was on the radio talking about uh, some of his stories. And I remember um, thinking, um, what you know, what a wonderful thing to do, and how uh, how important the work that he was doing uh, was to, you know, to our people, and not, you know, not just of my generation, but for generations to come. And, and I was thinking that mainly because of the importance of uh, um, having him as a storyteller record his stories and make it available in English. There was always that segregation. We were allotted a place in the loft uh, no, where no one else went except us. Uh, children from the school. Maybe they had a reason for this. But I all, it always stuck in my mind that there was that segregation right, right from the very beginning, even in the church. Even closer to home, Harry Robinson's stories from the Okanagan Band have appeared in book form. Did you know Harry Robertson? Harry Robinson? Mm -hmm. I was really deeply influenced by, by Harry and, and um, as a teacher, I think probably he was one of my main teachers. And um, his method of storytelling and his philosophy and his outlook on life were, had a profound effect on me, on my thinking and my understanding about the oral tradition. As a friend and mentor, George Riga was also obviously important, and he wrote the introduction to your novel, Slash. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see his play, The Ecstasy of Rita Joe? Mm -hmm. That that was um, a, a really happy coincidence that um, I met George. Um, it was um, out at what was called the Skolam, which was uh, a salmon feast uh, that we used to have on, on the Penticton Reserve. And he was talking with someone about uh, the play. And I, I was listening to him as he was discussing that. And I, I swung around slowly, and I was sitting, before I knew it, I was sitting right in front of him, you know, listening intently, and I, I was about 17 or 18 or something like that. And um, I just stopped talking, and he asked me if I was interested in seeing the play. And I said, yeah. So he gave me some tickets to go. And I remember when we left that night, not a word was said for maybe an hour from all of us. And, and it changed. Uh, it changed my way of looking at uh, what story could do and how it could be presented. 
and um, we became friends after that. Did you get to meet Chief Dan George through the process of Ecstasy of Rita Joe? Uh, actually, that was that. I met him after the play. He came out to the reserve, and he was uh, um, part of uh, one of the speech-making events that they do at those things. Anyway, he came out to the reserve, and uh, so we all got to meet him. And because I was, you know, hanging around George a lot and hanging around um, the people who are, you know, involved with the play, because I was just so fascinated with it, and uh, I, uh, he introduced me to to uh, uh, Dan George at the time. And of course I was uh, starstruck because I thought he was just great. <laughs> How long have I known you, Canada? A hundred years? Yes, a hundred years. And I have known you in the freedom of your wings. And my spirit, like your wings, once roamed this good land. But in the long hundred years... I grew up in a traditional family, and the names of the land have meaning to me, like the name of this area here, St. Pinkton, which uh, Penticton, the city over there, is sort of, um, it's, it's the same word, but it's anglicized in pronunciation. It means um, the place where there will always be our people, and the place where our people always return to. And so that name has meaning for me in terms of what you just said about you know this being Indian land and all all of this area being Okanagan Okanagan land. When I fought to protect my home and my land, I was called a savage. When I neither understood nor welcomed this new way of life, I was called lazy. When I tried to rule my people, I was stripped of my authority. My nation was ignored in your history textbook. We were less important in the history of Canada than the buffalo that ranged the plains. Uh, the role that I have in my family is uh, as an archivist, recorder of history, and, and knowledge keeper um, by everyone in my family, even the ones that are older than me. I have older brothers and sisters who have different responsibilities, but my role has always been the uh, historian in the family and the knowledge keeper in the family. So that has been impressed on me all my life. And subsequently, my upbringing and training is different than, than my, some of my sisters and brothers. We, we would we live in the same house, but we have a different set of teachers. When you go to tell a story, uh, do you find yourself falling into a natural family rhythm, which you recognize as your own original idiom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, and I think every uh, storyteller in, in the Okanagan, at least, I won't speak for anywhere outside of the Okanagan, but in the Okanagan, the, the storytelling tradition is very strong, um, mainly because of the kind of uh, permaculturing that was practiced here as opposed to um, being nomadic or, or being uh, um, an agricultural sedentary population. We moved around a lot, but we were semi-permanent. So a lot of the uh, storytelling tradition is an art form that can be carried with you from community to community, from place to place. And uh, so the tradition is old, and, is, and it was uh, in, in this area very much the art form that uh, people practiced and, and took great pride in in terms of the skill uh, as a storyteller. One of the things that happens in the storytelling process uh, when it's passed on from one individual to the other, what I'm seeing inside when I'm recounting the stories of, say, my grandmother, Josephine Armstrong, um, is I see her, and I see her gestures, and I hear her voice, and I, um, it's, it's like her presence becomes real again in, in real space in my mind. I can see her. I can see her body, her, her face. I can even see where she's sitting, and she's the one talking. And, and I'm simply listening to her and re reiterating what she's saying or, or re-saying what she's saying in the storytelling. So that rhythm gets passed on through the sound of the words and the gestures and the, and the, the techniques of the storyteller. And that is very evident in, in, a, in a long line of storytellers. You can hear the different ways the, the storytelling is done. 
World Renewal Song. Nothing was good, winds blew and grasses died. I thought I was pitied, so I longed for a whole time song. I danced for it in deerskins. I made thought with paint in red lines from little finger to the left shoulder. I, silent, listening by dying grasses, began hearing at dawn. A new fire is lighted. The finished world is here, formed in mind patches. It is come, the song for rain and green and good. I sit by talking grasses now, with nothing more to make a good world of than thought paint and dance talk in lines. But song colors pour over my world, and my good time still goes on. Jeanette Armstrongs of tomorrow are inside this building today writing their stories and poems. Meanwhile, Jeanette is at the center of the reemergence of Native culture in Canada through writing and publishing. And Canada is a world leader in this new tradition, taking oral stories, sometimes for the first time, and putting them on to the printed page. This uh, concept of an Alkan in a literal translation would mean something like uh, uh, dropping maybe an idea through the, like a drop of water through the top of the head and, and uh, absorbing it by osmosis. So it's something, something like that. That's the literal image that you, can, that you could uh, conjure in your mind. And, and its meaning actually is referring to a process that we use so that we would be continuously guided by that principle uh, in terms of making peace uh, with others and seeking to be understood and, and to give understanding continuously and thereby changing the world through that. And I believe in that principle. I believe it is the strongest principle for acquiring knowledge and change in, in the world. And, and I know that uh, students and people who come here learn that principle and they go back and they will change their communities. They will change this country. I have no doubt of that. It's a strong principle. <laughs> So 